I'd originally planned on wearing my full Michael Myers getup to do this review. I would even said to my friend yesterday how excited I was to pull the old coveralls out of storage. And then I watched Halloween Ends this morning and I've decided to wear this shirt instead because it is Halloween time and we do need something round here to be scary. Come and join me folks as I review the last Halloween movie that I will ever watch. The plot. The movie opens in Haddonfield, Illinois with a brief flashback to Halloween night 2019. We meet Corey, who's about to babysit Jeremy in Haddonfield's only mansion, apparently. Jeremy's mom tells us Jeremy's been wetting the bed since all the Michael Myers stuff kicked off. So the second the parents are gone, Corey shows young Jeremy a real horror movie called The Thing, which I'm going to watch myself after this review's done, in hopes that it'll wash all the Halloween ends tastes out of my mouth. So Jeremy plays a Halloween trick on Corey by locking him into a room upstairs. And when Corey freaks out and kicks the door open, he launches the little bedwetter to his death, right as his parents are coming in the front door. The main story starts with Jamie Lee Curtis reminding us of all the previous good moments in Halloween movie history, probably so we'll forgive her for what she's about to do to we devoted fans. Nearly 15 minutes into the movie, Jamie Lee Curtis is still explaining things to us and I'm already fed up. We learn it's been four years since the last movie and that Laurie Strode's now in the middle of writing her memoirs. Because it's very common for people who've spent their lives a jittery, paranoid, traumatized mess to suddenly be capable of writing to a professional standard. And then we meet Corey again, who's now working as a mechanic. He gets beat up by a handful of small high school kids. Despite the kids not being afraid of him, they somehow are afraid of an old skinny geriatric Laurie Strode, who shoes them away before she shuttles Corey off to get his stitches where Allison works. And maybe romance is a Bruin. Back at home, Corey's getting it from his cartoon mother who denies him dessert because somebody's texted him during dinner. And man, is David Gordon Green ever laying it on thick for we idiots in the audience. Corey and Allison head to a costume party and on the way there, they have to change the radio station because it's still going on about Michael Myers. Two minutes into the party and Corey's been accosted by a creepy old man. And Allison's having to defend her choice of dates because everyone in Haddonfield's just as collectively ridiculous as they were in Halloween Kills. After a quick slam dance, Corey goes to grab a beer and wouldn't you know it, young Jeremy's mother is at the bar. Even though the woman we were shown 20 minutes ago in the opening scene wouldn't be caught dead in a place like this. So she takes her turn making sure we understand why Corey's going to end up a killer in this movie. And after he storms out and has his leave me alone you don't understand me moment with the beautiful, intelligent, trying to help help him out Allison, the gang of high school kids beats him up again, and breaks his glasses, and throws him over a bridge. And when he comes to, he's in an underground sewer dungeon thing. And after more than 40 minutes of waiting, we get to see Michael Myers' mask. When he chokes Corey and absorbs all of his memories, or uploads them to his own psyche or something. Anyways, Corey eventually escapes the sewer dungeon thing, but David Gordon Green's not done proving his point yet, so he has a homeless vagrant shout at him. And by this stage, of course he stabs him. Who wouldn't after the opening he's just endured? So in the off chance you're as idiotic as David Gordon Green assumes you are, he plants Corey outside Laurie Strode's place exactly the way Michael Myers would have stood there. And after scaring the shit out of everyone in the house, he takes Allison for a walk and tells her he killed the homeless man. And this somehow makes things romantic? So he brings her to the home where the babysitting incident occurred and the pair bond over I don't fucking know what. And while they're doing that, Laurie Strode pays a visit to Corey's cartoon mom, who blames everything Michael Myers did on her, the way everyone else in the town's doing, even though they were all completely behind her in the previous movie. And if I was somehow stuck there with Corey's mom in this shitty movie, I'd have been all like... My son. This town turned against him after the accident with Jeremy Allen. They would have felt for him. They would have helped him heal. But because your boogeyman disappeared, they needed a new one. All that stuff you just said, it doesn't make any sense in relation to this movie or the previous one, but more importantly, I hated this movie so much, I wasn't even going to superimpose myself into it, but a lot of my friends and subscribers say they really enjoy this stuff, so I'm doing this because I appreciate them. 
Not you, not your acting, definitely not this story. Nice house, though. In the very next scene, Corey and Allison are eating and Corey's a completely different human being. And of course, Allison's ex has to come over to the table to egg him on to illustrate how different he is. And you'd think this would put the lovely, responsible, traumatized by violence Allison off, but oh no, the outburst bonds her to the disturbed, scabby-faced motorcycle riding mechanic. And what the fuck is going on here? Corey heads back to the sewer dungeon place and naturally the ex-boyfriend follows him there. And once they're all inside, David Gordon Green gives me all the reasons I'll ever need never to watch another of his fucking movies again. He shows Michael Myers cowering to the boy who's just been beaten up and abused by tiny teenagers and his mom. And then he plays John Carpenter's epic piano track over top of Corey and Michael tag-teaming the ex-boyfriend. And each time the horror icon formerly known as The Shape drives his knife into the ex-boyfriend's body, he magically grows stronger. Or some fucking thing. Laurie Strode heads to the bar to tell the audience she thinks Corey's acting like Michael Myers because maybe we haven't picked up on that yet. And if that wasn't heavy-handed enough, they bring in young Jeremy's father to say the exact same thing while he's playing pool in the same bar for absolutely no reason. Then, the doctor who stitched Corey's hand earlier is back at his house with the nurse for a bit of extracurricular fun. And when she hears a ruckus in the other room, we find Corey killing the doctor. And wouldn't you know it, the icon formerly known as The Shape's there too. So the nurse is killed in familiar fashion and Corey watches on like a fucking moron. And if you thought this sudden, abrupt, inexplicable collection of events would mess a guy's mind up, you're mistaking David Gordon Green for somebody competent. Because all this shit's apparently turning Corey into James fucking Dean right before our eyes. And Allison's playing Natalie Wood on the back of his bike. Corey's parents smack him around and boot him out for no real reason, so he sleeps in the house where it all started. And Laurie Strode's there to wake him up with another clunky paragraph of unnecessary explanation. And in response to her telling him to leave Allison alone, Alone, he replies with, If I can't have her, no one will. Fuck off, movie. Fuck off. Fuck off. Fuck off. Fuck off. And after that ridiculousness, Corey goes to the sewer dungeon place to beat up Michael Myers and take his mask. And after he's done that, he lures the teenagers back to the mechanic shop and kills them too, dressed as Michael now. And then he heads to Laurie Strode's to kill her, but Laurie Strode beats the shit out of him. So he stabs himself in the throat with his massive knife. When Allison comes in, it looks like Laurie killed him. So she drives away without asking the person she's closer to than any other human being any questions. And then Michael Myers shows up to reclaim his mask. So Corey comes back to life for a sec in spite of his severed jugular and windpipe. So Michael breaks his neck. Then, Michael Myers and Jamie Lee Curtis's stunt double have a wrestling match in the kitchen, and Allison returns. And when it's all said and done, they parade the shape's body through the streets of Haddonfield and toss his no longer profitable corpse into a mulcher. And the entire time, we're treated to even more voiceover from Laurie Strode, who I think read us her entire memoir during the course of this movie. Movie. And there you have it, folks, a bunch of things that David Gordon Green put into a movie called Halloween Ends. Let's take a look at the good bits, shall we? The good bits. This movie was an hour and 51 minutes long. And while this was a very long time, it wasn't an hour and 52 minutes long. And for that, I'm grateful. The shite bits. For the record, I could have made a 45-minute in-depth video comprised strictly of the shite bits from this movie, but I've chosen to keep it short and simple, like a final argument between you and somebody you've just broken up with because you caught them doing something questionable with a family pet. When I can't find anything complimentary in a movie, I'm as guilty of falling back on the cinematography as any other wannabe film critic. It's easy, and it gives you a balanced, broader review. The lighting was provocative. The composition. The depth of field the camera movement, the choice of location. But I can't even resort to that with this movie because it just used the orange and teal color scheme everyone's used in every other friggin' movie since 2010. And apart from that, it doesn't look any different than any of the previous two Halloween movies, which spells laziness to me. As for the acting, I don't think I can point a finger at anybody in particular for standing out, although I did find Rowan Campbell's Corey as annoying as I imagined he would be before I saw the movie. Everyone else felt like they were grabbing themselves a paycheck, and I can't say I'd 
have been any different had I have read the script before signing on. My final shite point, maybe not surprisingly, is the movie as a whole and what it represents to me. I'll skip recapping my recap because my gripe is focused elsewhere. 44 years ago, the original Halloween gave horror fans and the film world in general so much of what we take as standard now in horror films. It proved a low-budget movie can have a massive impact if it's made by people who care about it. And it popularized the highly effective back-and-forth perspective shift between the victim and the perpetrator. It taught us promiscuity and sex and drugs can have a direct detrimental effect on your longevity. It solidified the strong female lead in Jamie Lee Curtis's brilliant performance of the young Laurie Strode. And most importantly to me, and most pertinent to this Halloween Ends movie, it gave us the shape. Michael Myers. A thing you can't connect with or reason with or defeat. Michael is a real-world physical embodiment of fear itself, which is an irrational and illogical concept. Rob Zombie's attempts at Halloween stomped all over the cerebral elements of Michael Myers, and without that irrational fear, you're left with just another guy with a knife. And somehow, David Gordon Green's managed to strip away even more of whatever remained of the shape's magnetism. In this supposed final chapter, he relegated him to a cowering bit part who's overpowered and dominated by a messed up kid who can't stand up to his own mother. As a complete film, Halloween ends shits on everything that made Halloween and Michael Myers special to all of its fans. And he was paid very well to do it. And to me, that is the real horror story here. The verdict. So, should you bother watching Halloween ends? Or should you maybe respect what Michael Myers used to represent in horror movies by giving this final movie a miss? To quote one of Laurie Strode's 212 monologues from this movie, evil doesn't die, it changes shape. After watching this movie, I can say the same thing applies to greed. It's always here with us in this modern world of movies. It just shifts around between reboots and remakes and reimaginings, hoping to find some money somewhere, hiding in one of the old familiar shadows cast by better directors and better writers from a long time ago. Now, obviously, if you're curious, you should watch this movie. And if you do end up watching it, let me know if it gave you the same feeling it gave me. That's a feeling that something is very wrong with modern horror movie making. Until next time, folks. It's me, Johnny, from that thing you just watched. If you enjoyed it, go down there and smash me in the face to subscribe. And if you want to watch another thing, there's one right there. Do it!